Welcome back to Global Now. Anyone alive in the 1980s will probably remember the global fear of the AIDS virus. It may now be to an extent treatable, but in its first years of existence it was an unknown and incipient threat. Well, today the man who is responsible for preventing outbreaks of disease in the United States warned that Ebola is the biggest challenge since then. Thomas Friedman from the Center for Disease Control was talking to a high-level World Bank forum in Washington. He said the world needs to act fast. I will say that in the 30 years I've been working in public health, the only thing like this has been AIDS. And we have to work now so that this is not the world's next AIDS. We can do that, I think, exactly as was said by all of the three presidents. Speed is the most important variable here. This is controllable, and this was preventable. It's preventable by investing in core public health services both in the epicenter or most affected countries, in the surrounding countries, and in other countries that might be affected. Public health is sorely underinvested in, and yet it is a best buy. Well, how would you like to be locked away for weeks with no access to family, friends, home, or even your job? With so many people being put into isolation just in the case uh, with Ebola, many are asking the questions about the rights of the individual when it comes to issues surrounding quarantine. Well, with us uh, to discuss all of this is Dr Sarah Chan, who's Deputy Director of Manchester University's Institute for Science, Ethics and Innovations. And from Boston University, we have Wendy Mariner, Professor of Health Law bioethics and human rights. Thanks to both of you for being with us here on Global. Uh, Sarah, to you first of all, because uh, lots of uh, potential restrictions being talked about, isolation, quarantine. Uh, looking at those infected, first of all, is it perhaps a little easier to navigate through that? People who actually have the infection and perhaps need to be isolated? From my point of view, the moral position is very simple. If I knew, for example, that I was an individual who was at risk of transmitting a disease and that by remaining in isolation for, let's say, two or three weeks, I could prevent harm and possibly death of, uh, say, 200 or 20 or even two people, I would think it would clearly be my moral obligation to do that. Your moral yeah. obligation, Wendy, legally, where would someone stand if they didn't want to play ball? Well, if someone has been infected with a dangerous disease that's easily transmitted, airborne, for example, or by close contact, um, they could be involuntarily confined if they were likely to pose uh, a risk of transmission to other people. But involuntary measures like that are usually limited to homeless people, people who are not able uh, to keep out of the public way. Sarah, does it become more complicated when we talk about potential victims? So somebody who's not infected, but uh, in some way you're, you are isolating them? Well, we're really talking there about different degrees of risk of harm. When it comes to quarantine being imposed on somebody, so say somebody who is unwilling to... Um, unwilling to isolate themselves, then the question becomes whether the state has the right to curtail the liberty of that individual. Now, rights and liberties are important to all of us, but the duty of the state is also to ensure the public interest. And we accept that the justification for limiting individual liberty, the justification... And who for decides, imposing... though? Who decides in terms of deciding who might be a potential victim? Right. Well, now, now we come to another point. In order to be morally defensible, we would expect that quarantine decisions about whom to put under quarantine and when are taken on a basis that is reasonable and justified, for which there is some scientific foundation that's done in a consistent manner. And that's clearly a matter for the, the policy makers, um, the public health officials, to make those decisions as they, as they are doing. Wendy, does that where it starts to get really complicated with uh, civil rights and human rights, that whole area of quarantine? We've seen in Sierra Leone, we've had lockdowns in certain areas. I mean, does the state have the power to simply do that? It certainly has the power, but it must use it wisely and therefore rarely. Uh, quarantine is really a preventive measure of last resort. It tends to be necessary only in cases of deadly diseases that are easily transmissible. If officials use it overzealously, they can lose the public trust and then all is lost. You could see that happening with the SARS epidemic in China when Beijing said it was going to quarantine the city. About 250,000 people fled. And if they had SARS, 
they could have infected people all over. And in terms of historically and, and precedence, what, what would happen with people that refuse simply to, to stay within that group, that area? Well, quarantine is really for people who've been exposed to a serious infection that's easily transmitted. So it depends on the nature of the disease. These people are not sick and they may never be. Um, and as Dr. Chang said, most people do stay home voluntarily. They don't want to infect other people. So involuntary measures are not often needed. Uh, Sarah, I know it's still being talked about, but if you got to that stage where large areas, large communities are quarantined, all manner of practical difficulties come up, as well as those issues of, of rights, because you're taking away potentially livelihoods, all of those sorts of things to think through. So while we accept that some curtailment of individual liberties is uh, at times, and I agree absolutely that it needs to be used sparingly, that it needs to be a proportionate response and be effective, while we accept that that is sometimes necessary, I don't think that absolves the state of the duty also to see to the welfare of the people who are put under quarantine. So, for example, when we impose duties upon people in the public interest, let's say the, uh, the obligation to do jury service, we say that the state must look after the, the people who are so called upon to serve. We say that you must not be put in danger of losing your job, you must be compensated for your time. In the same way, people who are under quarantine, quarantine restrictions yep. ought not to suffer unduly as a result of being placed under those restrictions. Wendy, very quickly, because we're almost out of time, because it, it, there are also suggestions of closing borders, closing airlines, almost ring fencing these three countries Morally, can, can you actually do that, just write off large areas, large countries? Well, regrettably, since there's no international quarantine authority, each individual nation state is responsible for making its own decisions, and it could be done. I'm not sure that's a practical decision, because um, it, people can travel from one country to another and may not, uh, they may not say they're coming from, may not be coming from a state that looks dangerous. Well, there we have to leave it. Uh, Wendy Mariner? Thank you very much for joining us from Boston and Sarah Chan. Thanks for joining us there from our studios in Manchester. A lot of background information available on our website. A lot of coverage, uh, some of the questions you have been posing. You can also send us uh, your questions to our Facebook. Uh, there's the address there on the screen. But that's it from today's Global. Thanks for watching. Hope you've enjoyed it. See you at the same time tomorrow. Bye-bye.